Well, good morning, Grand Center Alliance Church. Uh, my name's Chris, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Grand Center. And uh, I, it's my pleasure to uh, be able to break open the word with you this morning. We're in a series uh, in, entitled A Shelter in the Storm. And uh, so here's, here's kind of a little bit of background to how we came up with that. Um, two guys sitting in a couple of chairs trying to figure out where God is leading us. And so talking... Um, in talking with one another and lots of conversations with you guys, we realized uh, that there's something really important about gaining some tools uh, to navigate the storms that life inevitably will throw at us. And so as we kind of batted about things, we, we, we came up with this idea that uh, why don't we do a series based on go-to passages in our own lives that, uh, that all of us have these common storms that hit us. And so I, I'm excited this morning to break open the word. The, this morning is called, Is It Worth It? And uh, from time to time in my life, uh, I have like so many go-to passages. Lots of you guys, uh, I've, I've given you those passages when you've come to me because I've gone through those same things and said, hey, these passages, uh, this is what's helped me and now I can help you. And so uh, we're going to be doing this for the whole summer, and some of the passages are just incredible. They're amazing. In fact, all of them are amazing. Um, but for some of us, we deal with uh, some storms more than others, uh, some more deeply. And so these, these should be um, really helpful for you. And so uh, in this summer series, we just have three, kind of three things that we want to remember and uh, uh, talk about in each of these these messages and the first is that there's the call to build your life on Jesus and so this comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 Jesus sums up his whole sermon and uh, with with this parable about two builders building building houses one on the rock which which represents Jesus and his teaching uh, the other on the sand which is our own our own way, our own way of, of thinking about life uh, and so uh, Jesus is is his, his appeal is build your life on me. Build, I'm the rock. Build your life on my teaching. And so uh, what Jesus is looking for is a receptive, a receptive ear and heart and a response um, so that we don't just say, yeah, that sounds good, and then go about our day. Um, God's actually the foolish builder. That we hear it and then we try to put it into practice. And so these tools that we'll be giving you, these, these scriptures, uh, jot them down, reread them over and over, uh, get familiar with them because they will help you through the storms of life. Uh, secondly, there's an unseen war for your soul going on. Uh, the enemy, uh, the Bible describes him as a roaring lion, seeking, seeking someone to devour. And so we need to be on our guard. We need to have these tools, these weapons that we can use against his attacks. And as Bob very ably uh, said last week, I mean, the enemy is the father of lies. The Bible calls him the father of lies. Everything he utters is a lie. And so we have, to, we have to be on our guard. We need truth to hang on to because this unseen battle is raging all around us. And unfortunately, we tend to forget that. In fact, that might be our default setting is to, to view the world right in front of us, what we can see with our eyes, uh, physically see, and we forget what is going on around us, that, the, that there's an enemy out there. And uh, Ephesians chapter 6, of course, is, is what brings us to light, that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling against people. Our struggle, our main struggle, is not against humanity. It's against the spiritual powers of darkness that are threatening to engulf this world and engulf us. And so we need to have these tools. And thirdly, is the best news of all, is that the Bible has given us everything we need. That God's word is this shelter in the storm um, that we can run to uh, in any kind of uh, adversity. That we, can, that we can take God's word and it becomes our shelter. This is how Peter uh, talks about it in 2 Peter. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. <laughs> what an awesome promise. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And so this is the shelter. We run to God. We run to his word. And so, uh, kind of in celebration of this shelter, uh, again, in each of these sermons, we're going to do uh, just a celebration of the shelter of God's word. And so today, we're going to go to Psalm 19. Uh, verses 7 to 11. And this is what the psalmist says about the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, 
refreshing the soul. Sounds good already. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. I, I, I love this psalm. I love this celebration of the word. I, uh, and some, there's something about the, what, what the psalmist says here that, that really strikes me. As he reveals his love and the view of God's word, it ignites something in my heart. As I read those words, I want what he is saying. I want to have that. I love this imagery uh, of God's word, that it's, it's, it's sweeter than honey, and that it brings us joy, that it revives our soul, that it refreshes us, that there's something about going to the word of God that is just amazing, and it's life-giving. And so I just, I love this imagery. And I, I want to I look at the Bible the way this psalmist does. I want to see the word like that. I want to feel the way this psalmist feels about God's word and how rich and wonderful it is. His love song reminds me that you can't divorce the God of the Bible from what he says, from the Bible itself. And I think that's one of the issues in our culture right now that people will say, yeah, well, I, I, you know, I like the teachings of Jesus, and, but I don't like the God of the Old Testament or whatever whatever comes up. Um, But one of the things that the psalmist helps us to understand, you cannot divorce who God is, this wonderful God, this amazing God, this glorious God, from his amazing and glorious word. They're linked. They're one and the same. You can't have one without the other. Otherwise, you are just making up your own God, the God that is more palatable to you, the God that you would like to see. And that is no God at all. And so that's, that's one of the things this psalm does for me. Um, and finally, when my soul needs reviving, when I long for fulfillment, when I'm at my end, the word of God stands true and its message is life and the message is sweeter than honey. So this is the shelter that we run to. This is why we can run to it. It is the shelter in every type of storm and we have everything we need for every type of storm. We can run to the word of God and it can build us up and it can restore us, revive us, refresh us. That it can bring joy to a sad heart. So the storm that uh, I want to introduce today uh, I think is common for most of us and it's, uh, I've entitled it, Is It Worth It? And I think um, I think most of us, may, probably all of us, have been through this, this at least a time in our lives when we sat down and looked at our life and our, our faith and how we've been living and we've asked the question, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? I mean, I find myself, I've asked that at many different times, um, probably most often when I was single uh, adult. Uh, my young adult years, it was really tough. As I looked around the world, everybody seemed to be doing what they want and enjoying, and it seemed like, oh, I have to do this and have to do that. And, and so I uh, just really struggled with it and asked that question a lot. Is it worth it? And I, and I understand, um, as, a, as someone who's worked with youth now for, for over 20 years, I, I see our young people, I see that struggle, and I know the hardship it is to go to a, a secular college, or even a Bible college for that matter, and to struggle with that, to see everyone else seems to be enjoying themselves, and they're fine, Nothing's, nothing bad seems to be happening, maybe, I, maybe, maybe this is all a hoax, maybe it's just whatever. And so I remember those, and that, you know, it's a little ways back now, but it's not that far. Uh, I still remember those feelings. I still remember asking those questions and, and struggling with that. Now, this struggle didn't end uh, in my young adult years. years. It, it, it has continued, um, maybe less frequent. And yet at the same time, I have these moments when I'm just like, is it worth it? Is all the sacrifice, everything I'm doing, striving up to live to God's calling, the difficult of the journey, uh, is it really worth it? Because sometimes it just doesn't feel like it. 
And then I have these other questions. And you look around and you see, uh, you see people who you know are trying to climb the corporate ladder or you know they're shady uh, or, or they're trying to get promotions and they're, they're you know, gossiping and they're, they're, they're setting traps for, for maybe you uh, and, 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 and because they're, they're selfish and they want this promotion and they don't care about anybody else. And somehow they get it. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> right? And this is so you start thinking about why do evil people seem to succeed? Well, those who are trying to do the right thing suffer for it. Why does that happen? Because it, it, it really reinforces this idea that, well, maybe this isn't all worth it. Maybe it's just a hoax. Maybe I've just given my life to something that doesn't even matter. And finally, um, and this is one I, I feel quite a bit, uh, why does God allow people to get away with injustice? It doesn't it seem like that happens where you look at the world and uh, especially when you're just looking at it from today's perspective going, like, how are they getting away with this? Uh, you know, I, I, this is one of the questions that, that haunts me when I, when I think of uh, all the trafficking that's going on. How does God allow these evil people to suppress and to enslave these, these kids and these other people? Like, it's, it, it hurts my heart. Like, how does that happen? And so I start, I start kind of the, wondering about God's justice and wondering about what he's doing. And so I, I think most of us have been in that spot. Um, and I, I think part of uh, that, that injustice, that, that oh, there's, this is not right. Uh, I think that's part of the image of God that God has built into us, that we respond to those situations that way. But what do we do when we're feeling like that uh, and we're asking God the question, going like, what are you doing? And so, so that's the storm. And, and so the shelter in this particular storm, uh, I want to take us to Psalm 73. And so in, in this psalm, um, this is, you know what, this is maybe one of my main go-to passages that I've helped lots of you guys with <laughs> or shared with you, uh, that this has just been a, a, a huge passage in my life. It's been extremely important, and I go to it often. And so... Um, it's, I'm going to read the whole psalm. It's 28 verses, uh, but it is engaging. Just, just listen to what this, this psalmist has to say. Uh, he's, he goes through an entire journey of what we've just been talking about. So Psalm 73, starting in verse 1. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Pretty good start, right? But as for me, oh no, verse 2, we're already, we're already sliding off the track. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. I mean, haven't you been there? Where you've just looked around and it just seemed like everyone's succeeding. You're like, how can these people be, be succeeding? It almost looks like God's blessing them. And here's how he feels about this. He says, surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. Uh, so he's saying that, you know, I've been trying to live my life for God according to his design, according to his laws and how, he's de how he, he desires me to live. And it seems like as I look around, it's all in vain. I mean, haven't you felt that before? All day long. And so now he's, now he's going into a little bit of a hyperbole here. <laughs> all day long, I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. Now, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children, saying if he had spread this all over the place, uh, people, he, he would have led people astray, led people away from God. If he had just let people in, and this is how I feel about what's going on, this is the reality that I see, he would have deceived people. So obviously he didn't, which is, he's saying, well, good thing I didn't. 
And so uh, just a side note, this is, this is one of the reasons why maybe this whole series is based on this idea that we go to God first, that we go to him, that we lament to him, that we, we, we talk to him about how we're feeling like this psalmist is doing. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Yes, this, is, this, is, this resounds in my soul. Yes, it troubles me when I look around and I see this. It troubled him deeply. And then it all changes in verse 17. Until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? (laughs) A brute beast. I I feel like that too sometimes, maybe a lot. Yet I am with you always. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I, decide, I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. And I, okay, after reading this psalm, I hope you love it because this, this is a powerful, powerful message. This is a powerful psalm that just, uh, it does something to us. It, it takes us on this kind of roller coaster journey and we're like yeah I feel like that yeah why is that happening and then it turns boom just like that and suddenly I'm going like whoa what's going on here his just entire transformation of the of his way of thinking his perception of reality is completely switched so what happens okay so as we get into this uh lessons from the psalmist in psalm 73 uh there's two lies that lie at the heart of this storm that is it worth it storm number one first lie is that God is not just. Because of what we can see with our eyes, because of how it makes us feel, uh, because we've transitioned into something where we're like, what? Yeah, like what's going on here? Like, you know, what are you doing, God? Uh, we start questioning his justice. And so um, I, I think this is, this is kind of what's happening is that we've started, we've kind of made this transition where we've forgotten that life is actually about God and we've made life about ourselves. So this is, what, this is what's going on. This is what's the heart of, of our, when we start to, to misunderstand and uh, be unable to kind of take in what God's justice really is about, it's because we've started to think about ourselves and our own circumstances and we've taken our eyes off Jesus. And so we start thinking, well, maybe God isn't just. We start to, to get into the lie as we see the psalmist has. Secondly, the lie is that living my life for God is vanity. It's all in vain. And that's, that's a big one, right? And it follows right on the heels of God is not just. Because if he isn't just, well, then it is vanity. It is, we, it is in vain. It isn't worth it. If God really isn't just, then we have a problem. And so these two lies are at the heart of, of the storm that this psalmist and, and us, we feel when we're asking that question, is it worth it? So what are the lessons uh, from, this, from this psalmist? Well, first of all, we find that sin distorts our view of reality. It makes us susceptible to believe one of, or both of, probably both of these lies. And so what we have in two different parts, we have in verse 3, uh, he, he confesses his envy. So he's envious of the, the wealthy people who he knows are not righteous. They're, they're, in fact, they're wicked, he says, <laughs> right? And so he's envious of, of not just their wealth, but the, the seemingly easy life that they have, that somehow God's justice isn't proving true because of how they are succeeding. And so his, his circumstances completely co- co- um, 
colored his way of, of thinking and, and of seeing life. And then in verse 21, he admits to being embittered. He's embittered. And so here's what we see. Uh, this is what sin does. It distorts how we view life. It actually distorts reality. So the reality that he is looking at is not real. It has been distorted by sin. And so it's very obvious that he's deeply troubled. He says, I'm deeply troubled when I'm trying to understand this because his, what he's looking at doesn't make sense because of what sin has done. It's put that lens over his eyes and as he's viewing everything, he's viewing it through this lens and this sin has distorted reality and distorted uh, God's justice. And so we have this, um, this human sense of justice or injustice that differs from God because of sin's Distortion. And so we're unable to see God's justice. We're unable to understand it because sin has clouded us. It's made us see a reality that's actually not real. And so here's, here's maybe just an example of, the, of what happens with this distortion is that this seems to be the human default that we desperately desire, desire mercy when we make mistakes, when we err. But we... we like really want justice when something's done against us or we see it out there and, and we see other people and we want justice. And so this is, this is the distortion. That This is how we know that we've started, we've taken our, our, our view away from this is about God to this is about me because we, de- we just want this mercy. We, we give ourselves so much grace when it comes to, oh, uh, you know, I, it's just a mistake. I, I, you know, I, was, uh, I had a hard day at work and so I lashed out. You know, we have all of this justification because we want mercy. Uh, but when somebody wrongs us, it just switches. We need justice. I mean, even someone, so my example is, is how silly we are sometimes. Is that you can be driving down the road and somebody cuts you off and you're just like, ah, right? You have no, re- no idea what was going on. You just assume that they're a jerk, right? So he's, oh, I hope a cop pulls that guy over. Uh, but how many times have you done that, right? And you don't want the cop to pull you over. You, you don't want to get a ticket for, for bad driving. And you're, well, you know, I, I just had a really, I had a fight with my wife or I'm thinking about my, my, my kids and the path they're taking and I wasn't paying attention. So you want mercy when, when you're the perpetrator, but when someone does it to you, justice. So that's how we know that we have gone off the mark of God's justice because it becomes about us. So sin distorts our view of reality. Secondly, so what we have here uh, is, is where the trans, transformation or uh, transition happens for, for the, our psalmist is when he enters the sanctuary. And so worship and God's presence. Because in the sanctuary, we've got to remember, the Holy of Holies was, was, you know, this is as close as he could get to the Holy of Holies, but that's where God's manifest presence was. And so he's, his closeness to God did something. Uh, and, and, and so it helped us, it helps us, and help, just as it helped us, the psalmist, to realign our distorted view of reality. So what happens is, is we're flooded with faith. Faith gives us eyes to see what is really happening. And so as we're aligning our, our perspective of life to God's perspectives, it changes what we see. And so, uh, you know, this is one of the really powerful things about worship, is that worship, um, sometimes we're like, oh, yeah, whatever, we'll... We'll just skip the worship or we'll come late or <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, or, or, or I can't sing or whatever. Uh, um, but, worship, but music and, and um, song is part of this worship experience that, that we declare these things that sometimes we don't even believe are true, but we know are true. Or maybe better put it, sometimes we don't feel like they're true, but we know they're true, so we sing the truth. It's just like going to God's word. We know it's true, even sometimes we don't feel that, that it is. And so worship is very powerful and also part of worship is the, is the preaching of the word, the reading of God's word, how important that is to us, that it changes our, something happens, it changes our perspective when we start focusing on God. Our circumstances begin to look different. Like the circumstances haven't changed. So as a psalmist, these guys are still, you know, living, living it up, living it high, amassing wealth, seemingly carefree. That's still, it's, you know, that, that's still the circumstance. But what's changed? Well, the psalmist's entire perspective has changed. His entire, his entire worldview has been altered simply by this stepping into the sanctuary of God because it's reminded him of who God is and what he has done. That's what worship does for us. 
And so, of course, also the closeness of God's presence. And uh, there's, there, I mean, it's one of the reasons why we long to get back together because there's something about being together, physically together, that there's this, something happens. The presence of God becomes, it becomes different that, that, that we don't experience on our own when we experience it with the, with the people of God. And so what also happens from this is we start getting a longer view of life. And we need this longer view of life and to complicate, to contemplate the outcome of the type of life that we live. And so this is what is, you know, this, he did, the psalmist doesn't, doesn't intentionally do this. This is what happens when he starts seeing life differently. All of a sudden, it's a longer view. Oh, nobody's getting away with anything. That God's justice is much bigger than we think. And he, God sees the world differently than we do. And so part of the goal of, of having this shelter, this going to the word of God, is to help us to see the world and life the way that God does. And so I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, and we, we need to have this longer view. Uh, our, our default setting, I guess, is to view just rest right in front of us, the short term. How are these people getting away with it? Because we're looking at it right now. We're not looking at it in this eternal perspective that God has. And so that's, that's often, it just makes, uh, you know, makes it like a great place for, for lies just to creep in and for us to believe stuff. Uh, it's also the place where, where um, we start realizing that God's justice and, God's, uh, and fairness aren't the same thing. And so in our human distortion of God's justice, we often equate it with fairness. And that's, that's a human issue that we have. Um, one of God's ap- attributes isn't fairness. It's justice, and those things are different. And so we struggle sometimes when we see uh, other people uh, getting what we don't. And what happens is, uh, we call it fairness, but actually it's envy. Exactly what the psalmist is talking about. And envy, dis- like this passage just told us, envy distorts our view of reality. Oh, wait, we need to move on here. Our... Uh, our third and final uh, realization, uh, or sorry, uh, lesson from the psalmist is the realization that we have nothing except God himself. I think this is so cool. So what happens is uh, the psalmist comes to this point near the end of the psalm where he realizes all I have in heaven is God. And all I have on earth and all I desire on God, there's nothing I desire more than God himself. And so what, what his his view of reality has made this massive transition from himself to God and he realizes that he has everything that he needs, that he has the most important, uh, greatest thing possible. The only thing that really matters is that he has God today and he has God tomorrow. That changes the way we think. It changes the way we view life, that we have God today And we have him tomorrow. And the result of living apart from God's design is separation, not just for eternity, but separation now. And the psalmist in this text starts to realize these people are living their lives in vain. The vanity is actually for those who are amassing wealth and living in an unrighteous manner because the end, the outcome, is is horrifying. That separation from God uh, includes today and tomorrow. That they don't get to commune and be close with God now, which is such an incredible blessing. They don't get to experience it that. And then at the end of their life, they still have to be separated from God. But choosing God's path means living with, with him both now and in eternity. So we get to have Jesus. One of the, one of the desires for many of my, my friends that aren't Christians is that I just I want them to know Jesus now. I, I, don't want, like, I want them to become Christians, but it's not just so that they can go to heaven sometime and avoid hell. I mean, that's, you know, that's part of it. I, w- I want to be with them in heaven. But I want them to experience what life with Christ is right now because there's no other way to live life. Nothing else in this life really matters when you have Jesus so I just, my heart breaks for them because I, I don't want them just at the end of their life, even though this is okay, but uh, it, it's the best case scenario is that they get to live for Jesus their whole lives and then go get to see him. So that's my desire for, for the people that I love that don't know Jesus. So the, our, our final uh, part of this message is, well, what are the tools then to navigate the storm? The so what, if, if, uh, if you would... Uh, if Bob was preaching. <laughs> so tools, what are the tools that we need to navigate this, the storm of, is it worth it? Well, the first one 
is we need to respond with repentance to God's conviction. Understand that if you are struggling with God's justice, if you are looking around and going like, why is everyone else succeeding? What's wrong with me? What's going on? Why, why am I here and everyone else seems to be just doing fine? Nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody, nobody has the pressure that I have. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Right? You just get into this. It's just, it's all about me. It's, oh, if only. At the heart of that, there's, there's sin. And so our response to God is to go in repentance. Not just feel sorry for a little bit, but to actually repent. Go to God and go like, because sometimes you don't even know necessarily what the sin is. Um, obviously in our text, he identifies it and says, well, I had envy and bitter, bitterness. And so that's what had clouded his judgment. And so whatever it is that is, is causing this, is causing your view of life to be like, oh, is it worth it? Repent. Ask God to, to show you exactly. He will. The whole, that's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is this conviction, this, this here, come to me, come, come and, and receive life. Turn away from this path that is leading you into darkness, that is leading you into this skewed view of reality and causing you to, to believe these lies and to, uh, and to go down this path of really despair. And so the call from God is to repent. Come to me. And I'll give you life. Uh, uh, the second tool is uh, we need to create sacred space in our life where worship with God's people is a priority. This is so important. And we, this text is one of those key texts that reminds us of how important the people of God are. How important worship. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm just not talking about music when I say worship. Um, that's part of worship. Uh, but it's bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. And so when we're talking about worship, we're talking about turning our eyes to Jesus. And so we need to create that space. And so here's, here's one of the struggles that we've had, and I've felt this. Uh, you know, in fact, I felt this stuff. Maybe it was envy. <laughs> uh, with with my, coaching my, my son and my daughter in hockey. Um, it's hard to have... So here's what... Sorry, I need, I need to give you some kind of background. We, we decided uh, long ago when, when my, fun, my son first started hockey uh, is that we were going to create what we called some sacred space that hockey wasn't going to creep in on. And for us, because 1030 was our service, um, you know, we created this space from, I think it was about from 9 o'clock in the morning till uh, 1 o'clock. And so that, that was sacred space. It was space for us uh, to remember that hockey wasn't most important or anything other than these other things. It was God. It was, it, was a, it was a very tangible way to show our kids and ourselves Jesus is our life. And, he, and we need to, that needs to come out in the way we live. And so we sacrifice all other things. And so as this pandemic hit and and that we now have these services, we still, at 10.30, uh, have, have created that sacred space. That's when we watch the service. Now, there's nothing magical about 10.30 in the morning at all. Sunday morning, there's nothing, right? But because we have created that space, because we want to communicate to ourselves and to our children that this is important, that God is the most important thing in our lives, that we serve him, that we need to turn our eyes on him, that we've created this sacred space for this to happen. And so, Every Sunday morning at 10.30, we gather around our television and we take in the service. And yeah, it's a gong show. <laughs> so I don't want to give you a, uh, a, an unrealistic picture of what goes on at our house that all our children are sitting there like this and watching. <laughs> That's, not what happened. That's not what's happening. Uh, but the sacred space is being held. And sometimes it's very difficult, um, especially with the younger ones, right? Um, but that, but my, my goal, again, isn't just this short-term pay attention and, and whatever. Uh, it's, long, it's longer than that. It's a longer view because I want my kids to understand that God is so important to us, not just so important, that he is everything to us. He is really all we have. And so that's, that's, that's my appeal to you. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be 1030, but to create some space that is sacred, uh, especially if you're a family uh, have a family, and so you can communicate to your children and, and for them to pass that on, that this is important. Uh, it's not because there's some kind of religious thing happening. Uh, it's because we love Jesus. And finally, um, the tool, one of the tools to navigate in this storm is that Christ lives in you. 
Uh, in fact, there's a very awesome passage in Colossians where it actually says these words, Christ in you, meaning plural, not just singular, but Christ in you as the people of God, the hope of glory. So is it worth it? Yes, it is. And here's how, here's how Paul puts it in Colossians. Now I, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave to me, or gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Ah, that sounds pretty awesome. That's what we're trying to do. Probably not as good as Paul, but that's what we're up to. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Isn't this awesome? This is a mystery as something that's been hidden for thousands of years has now been revealed to us. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that's the people who are not Jews, the gr glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is what the psalmist was waiting for. He didn't get to, he didn't get to see this. This was in the future. This Christ, the, the Christ in you, uh, the, the living God living within you. This is the power of God's word. This is why we need to go, yes, it's worth it. That God's word is sweeter than honey. That we can go to it and go, yes, this is my hope. This is who we serve. This is what I need to shelter in this storm. It's Christ in me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this psalm. It's just incredible. Thank you for the whole thing, Lord Colossians too. Thank you that you live within us, that the, the living God lives within his people, breathing life into us through your Holy Spirit. That we have this, this amazing, uh, this amazing treasure the, the the lord of all the earth the creator the almighty god the holy 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 is the lord god almighty lives within his people individually and collectively thank you for that truth thank you for this shelter and lord if we're dealing with sin i pray that now for your conviction that you would convict us lead us to repentance lead us to life help us to get rid of the distorted view of reality that we all struggle with and instead, Lord, help us to see through eyes of faith, eyes that are fixed on you. We just pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.